How are you? Good. How are you? It has been an action-packed month, I would say, for the Shattuck family, Alice. Yeah. Uh, just ran into the the sound of Tony Maserati. Did you see what happened? What happened with them? No, I don't know so, anything about that. So this is from the Sports Hub ninety eight five. Mike Felger was out at a hotel, like in the media room at a hotel, mm-hmm. it, you know, where the fax machine would be usually and a couple computers to use. Mm-hmm. Behind him were two guys, young black men, and Tony Maserati, who was do- Felger was do on on location doing a remote, and Tony Maserati said from the studio, "Look out for those dudes behind you." Felger, they look like the guys who stole your car. And so it was taken as a racist thing or whatever. And mm-hmm. so now Maserati is apologizing. We have to clean up something from Friday. We had a bad moment on Friday afternoon. And so we just want to clean up that little bit of business. And so, Maz, the floor is yours. Okay, so as you said, late, <clears throat> late in the show on Friday, I made some comments that angered and upset some people, and rightfully so. So uh, I wish I could take them back. I can't. They were uh, insensitive, they were hurtful, and frankly, they hurt the cause for those of us who believe in racial and social equality and all of those things, and I do. I'm on that side of the line, which is what made this thing so difficult in so many different ways. So I owe everyone an apology. He doesn't owe anybody an apology. He just made a joke. The dudes behind Felger were black guys. If they were white guys and they fit what in Tony's mind would be the people who stole Felger's car, then I'm sure he would have made that or something else. It's nobody's hurt. It's fine. It's fine. Well, uh, and I mean, and I don't really know anything about sports radio personality, so I don't know like what any of these people are like. But I the but I'm really on the good side. I promise. Thing is so. Like, I don't know. Do you think that matters to the people that are giving you grief for this? No. It's do you globe- think, like, do you, th- I mean, and it's just so revealing because it seems to me that a lot of people who just sort of casually follow the racial justice stuff mm-hmm. and aren't as into, like, debunking it as, for example, like, you and I have followed this a lot and paid a lot of attention to the type of stuff these activists do. But it seems to me that for a lot of people who just sort of casually follow these movements, they, like, think there's actual bad guys out there who are like, yeah, I'm against racial equality. I love when cops just shoot black guys randomly yeah. on the streets like they think that that's the bad guy so then they're like confused when the activists come for them for doing something totally innocuous and they're like wow i feel so bad because i'm really on the side of this movement right you know like i'm not one of those bad guys listen none of us is a against racial equality like nobody right. actually, here is and- for that it's such a straw man but it's so amazing to me that like these good liberals that follow along with the movement like believe that there's like really they're like no you don't understand i'm one of the good ones i'm totally on your side i didn't mean anything mm-hmm. by it like you think all the other people they went after meant something by it? you think dave no. andelman meant something by it like no. i mean yeah. it's so it's so interesting. I just hope more people see it. Like, I don't know. Do you think he'll wake up from this experience and think like Tony Mas? No, but he, but he is not like a bomb thrower. He is a guy who I used to see him at my station mm-hmm. when I was the receptionist. And when I worked for WRKO back then. I didn't know him, but I've now worked at three places he's worked, right. both in Entercom, at the Herald, and the Lowell Sun. And the word on Tony Maz is he's an angel. He's a great guy. And so even though he's got a radio gig that pays him a hell of a lot of money for not doing a whole lot, I don't think, <laughs> everybody wishes him the best because he's like a, just a great guy. Mm-hmm. He's one of those guys that everybody has goes out of their way to say, guy's awesome. Um, but here's my thing to, as well. Do, um, do young black men not steal cars? Is that inaccurate? Do young white men not steal cars? Do young Hispanic men not steal cars? Mm-hmm. Are these three groups that it's unbelievable to think that they'd steal cars? Why are you not allowed to say – why is it hurtful? A lot of car thieves are young and white or young and black or young and Hispanic. It just happens to be. Those are the three biggies, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, young men account for a lot, certainly. And definitely, (laughs) although a lot of people – there's – I'll preface this because I don't want to be in trouble by saying that there are a variety of very large socioeconomic forces that contribute to this. I would say there's a disproportionate amount of crime in the young black community. 
And uh, and most yeah. of that impacts black people more than it impacts white people too, because most crime is committed within your own race. So most of that crime is hurting black people more than it's hurting well, white people sure, too. For sure, but, but, but it is so but, yeah, out, out, I mean, it's not an of, untrue thing. Well, right. It's, so it's okay. It's okay. Those guys who were in the business center of that hotel were probably not car thieves. I don't know what a lot of people hang out in business centers of hotels who are car thieves. But who cares? Who cares? He just said something flippantly to make a joke. I don't think that him or Felger or in, in, any of these people have anything to prove that they have that they th have to show us that they don't have hate in their hearts. I don't think they've done anything. And I'll say the same thing for Jerry Callahan or Minahan or Dennis uh, or John Dennis. <clears throat> I don't think those guys owe it to society to prove that they're not racist because I don't think they've done anything racist. I don't think they have. And I hate this idea that everybody has to, you know, the guys, uh, the EI guys got, just got whacked. But this guy has to grovel. He's sick. I think he's good. I think Tony Mendez is like really sick, like with cancer or something. I don't mm. mean to make it sound like my uh, my guy from Tennessee, but his voice is obviously straining here. Just leave the freaking guy alone. He made a joke, okay? It's like Rickles used to make these jokes all the time. Well, yeah, and and you know, like somebody <sighs> else said in the chat, um, you know, that he's such a good liberal and they eat their own, and it's so mm -hmm. true. And like we talk about that all the time. They don't come after the people who. Like, don't pay any attention to them who don't bend the knee and listen to their stuff. They come after the people that they know that they have power over. You know who hasn't been invited to a drag queen story hour? Me. <laughs> no one's asked me to go to their drag queen story hour. No one's asked me to go to their Black Lives Matter protest. You know? Right. And because I don't pay any attention and they know that i'm not going to put up with stupid stuff and do you know what you get for going in their dumb protests and posting what they say on social media you get to walk around for the rest of the time that you're interested in listening to them in the middle of a minefield all the time and you have yes. no idea when you're going to step on a stupid landmine and get blown up like you're a member of the kkk even though you did absolutely nothing wrong and supported everything that they that they said they wanted you to support, you know, it, and that's that's the truth because it's about control and it's about believing the narrative and it, and you can't you can't veer like one inch off the thing. Look at J.K. Rowling, right? J.K. Rowling is a huge liberal. She's so yes. liberal. She's liberal on every freaking issue. She's like basically a socialist, and and she's cast completely out of the camp into the cold exiled because she just, and she doesn't even not like trans people, right? Like it's not, right. her position isn't even anti-trans. She just as a female victim of domestic violence in her life thinks that there ought to be like single sex women's shelters for like battered women where you don't allow well, pervert men in a, there. She was a victim. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know a lot of her life story. I know that she was destitute at one point. Yeah. Cause she escaped from an abusive home with her infant. Wow, Jesus. Yeah, so she just happens to think that we shouldn't let men with fetishes come be in women's shelters with the battered women. Like, <laughs> you know, and and for that, for that she's cast completely out. She's done. You know, like because because and good for her that she doesn't care what they think of her enough, but it's like if you show them that you care what they think, they they come after the liberals, you know. They they don't come after conservative oh, people for the trans stuff or whatever they come See, after the people that they think they have some kind of claim on exactly right and if they it's it's much it's like predator if it bleeds we can kill it if they notice that you're bleeding they know they can kill you so that's what tony maz has done tony maserati mm -hmm. here is now they know they can get him they know he's not impervious you got a guy like howie carr they don't even bother getting him. Yeah, they don't, try, give they don't sit there and record a show and try and find secret stuff to get him on like they used to do to Jay Severn and everybody. And all of those things, and I do. I'm on that side of the line, which is what made this thing so difficult in so many different ways. So I owe everyone an apology. Oh. It's not who I am. It's not who we are. He's not a guy who makes jokes about car thefts. <laughs> Because it's a dangerous cliche or something. I mean, it's so just living backwards here. It's just a joke about car thieves. Okay, there were young, youthful guys behind behind him. We don't have to. The assumption doesn't always have to be. Oh, oh, I see. He's judging <laughs> them as less than. 
you know, just because races are involved doesn't mean that everything we say that can be misconstrued is absolutely racist. And that's the end of the story. I can tell you that until I'm blue in the face. Those of you who know me will believe it. Those of you who don't, won't, and you probably shouldn't. If I saw and heard what you did, uh, I feel the same way. And you have a right to be upset. The- you know what? Let me find the original one because I don't think you've you've heard it. Have you heard it? Uh, I don't think so. Like the actual comment that he yeah. made? Yeah, no, it's... It's terrible what they've obviously been doing to him, and then they have him walking around thinking that he did something horrible. And like, no, you have no reason to believe I'm not a horrible racist piece of crap because that's what I'd believe about me too. Like, really, that's what you'd believe about a person who made a joke about car thieves, right? And I, I didn't even know he was like sick or whatever. But it's like, especially just. But they're okay, they're ghouls. The audio. They're this... ghouls. They have no shame. And the, they don't Yeah, care. I want to know now who the two guys behind you are. That's what I want Okay. Because <laughs> if I were you... I'll be off in two minutes. I'm just doing... I got just... If, if I'm too loud, just let me know. Honestly. <laughs> no, they can't. Two, two more minutes. Two dudes they can't in the us, couch. Right? They're waving. No, not you. Me. Okay, no. So I would be careful if I were you because the last time you were on a couple of guys like that, they stole your car. <laughs> Here's Chris in Boston. Go ahead, Chris. Hey. What- Is that terrible? A couple of guys like that? Aha. Uh-huh. Do, do you, I mean, do you think it's bad? I don't think it's that bad. I mean. Here's the rest of the apology. The only thing I can really do is apologize for it. Um, again, you know, there is, when we're talking about these sorts of issues, there is a line somewhere, and I can assure you I stand on the right side of it. There you go again, Alice. Mm-hmm. But you, again, that doesn't excuse what I said or did on Friday. It was really, I meant, if anyone cares, to poke fun at you, Mike. Uh, it didn't come off that way. It came off as something far broader and uh, ignorant. And uh, I, I'm regretful of that. I don't know what more I can say other than I'm sorry to you and to Murray for dragging you into it. Oh, please. For Jimmy Stewart, for the people here at the station, let alone friends and colleagues in the business who are dealing with it on assorted different levels. So... <coughs> um, Again, all I can Top tell you is it's it. not who I am. And I was it got a little silly and stupid at the end of the show. I was trying to be a wise ass like I often am. And it just came out wrong. And I wish I could give you a better answer than that because we're in a business where we should be careful about what we say and how we say it. And uh, And I wasn't. So... I mean, even if, even if you say... Wow, what a terrible thing to say. What an ugly joke or something. Or you assume something bad about it, right? Say he say it was even something worse than that, right? Yep. When you're in a business where you talk for hours every day, some of the stuff that you're going to say isn't going to land and you're not going to like how it came out when you said it. Totally. That's just how it goes, right? Like, we only talk for like 45 minutes a day together doing this show mm-hmm. and there's stuff that I don't like how it came out what I said and I wish I could rephrase it or put it back or you know I, I don't feel great about what I said after but you can't live like that because you have to get up and talk again and you can't sit around sucking we're in a business where we have to be very careful about what we say no you're in a business where you talk for entertainment off the cuff and sometimes you don't like how stuff turns out I mean just move on to the next segment and have a good day like you right. don't have to sit here you didn't kill somebody you know like this doesn't have contrary to what liberals would have you believe about like an off-color joke and i don't even think this is like something that bad but like even if you say it's like some kind of off-color joke or inappropriate or something it doesn't it then he says it and then it goes into the ether and then it's gone it didn't hurt anyone right move on sticks and stones like i don't know what to tell people but like the it happens and liberals think that like these words are very harmful but the words aren't harmful it's not the no, words not that harmful. make the harm. No, there are just scolds out there and, and people who feel they're designated deputies of social justice out there who just want to st- score points on social media and feel important and self-righteous. And so you, you got to be impervious to that. I mean, maybe mm-hmm. it's easy for me to say, but yeah. But who knows? By I the mean, way, some people asking about the human rights campaign equality oh, marriage yeah. sticker on your laptop. I got that in Philly. Um, yeah, I got that in Philly. I got a Trump sticker on this too. 
that uh, actually Herschel Walker had noticed. He was thrilled <laughs> at, at Radio Row five years ago, whatever. Um, uh, that is from in Philly. They had that at um, at the convention center where during the Democratic convention, and um, I grabbed a sticker. I love those colors together. I had a shirt in 1979 mm-hmm. that was those colors. I wore to Washington School in Winchester. Yeah, that had, was blue, but had yellow stripes in the corner. Mm-hmm. So I like. Lo- I love the logo. I love the color scheme. Yeah, it's a gay thing, right? Yeah, it's human rights campaign. Actually, I have a a friend, a Republican friend, who was uh, he who's a young man who was a Republican who's gay and was a big fan of Richard Say, who's also a Republican who's mm-hmm. gay. Found him very inspiring. And when human rights campaign um, endorsed John Tierney, the corrupt longtime Democrat, over yeah. Richard to say he ripped the human rights campaign oh, equality really? sticker right off his car because he was like what are you doing like if you're about but remember he was tea party to say and he was yeah, bad and he was it was, it was a things. homophobe yeah. too like they had him yeah they, no yeah. and that's why he was so mad about it that he was like the gay organization is endorsing like this corrupt long time terrible politician over like an actual mm-hmm. like moderate gay normal person totally qualified great republican like it, 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 and found it very disillusioning about the the gay movement and like the activism around it in general about how they treated it i like the logo i really like the logo mm-hmm. now we've got oh, by the way alice the the, yeah. the the um the uh number one um uh, Jeff on Facebook has been asking about the table we put outside because we put it out because we put it out yeah. last night. Yeah. Did you do a curb alert yet? You I need did do to a do a curb, curb alert. alert. I did it earlier today. Yeah. Okay. So, did um, anyone take it? No, but I don't want any of you guys to take it. It's not worth it. It's just that to, I mean, maybe it might be worth it because it actually it's kind of a, a lovely table. It's just a little bit nicked, but the marble and on top is nice, right? It needs to be resealed. I think the sealed? marble What's top and mm. just like it kind of like absorbs stuff weird or something i don't know well it absorbs a lot of stuff it, in this house comes out weird. yeah i don't know yeah anyway and it needs a new drawer pull on the drawer yeah because our kids broke that but off but it probably <laughs> was at one time a fairly expensive little side table probably, I, probably. it's super heavy so feel so free to grab that you'll see makes it, a you'll difference see, you'll see I don't it know. west newbury facebook fi- fi- anyway um okay uh, anyway. alice so okay uh, speaking of words hurting people by the way you look beautiful today thanks you're welcome um, speaking of words hurting people, there's this whole rural doll brouhaha. Yes. Um, where they're, they're editing up a bunch of his books to make them more racially sensitive. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and various other things like taking out the word fat and like, I, you know, he's, Roald Dahl is big into, like, colorful descriptions of people. And, mm-hmm. of course, all this is complicated by the fact that Roald Dahl actually, in his actual political views, was somewhat of a horrific anti-Semite. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, it is what it is. People in the past thought differently and acted differently. And sometimes odious people also wrote good books, too. You know, so. Well, I think it generally, if you're talking about, and what period was this, like, uh, 1900? Turn of the century. Yeah, I think. Um, I think yeah, if, like if you the, the if you're going to grab 40s maybe if you're going to grab <clears throat> anyone from 1899, mm-hmm. almost every writer in almost every person is going to be problematic. It will not be acceptable for 2023 mm-hmm. in some way or another. Oh yeah, I mean, and I'm not I'm not trying to defend. He said nasty things about a bunch of people. I like he sure. So, so yeah, uh, there doesn't really seem to be much offensive content in what they've actually been editing out of his books. The fact that he was an anti-Semite also just seems to be a convenient excuse that they have. So like, I'm not going to go to the mat to fight for Roald Dahl's personal beliefs on stuff. Um, but a lot of his books are just fantastic. Um, and in his language is so colorful and so personal to him that to dull it down just seems like weird desecration of something that someone created, you know? Well, yes, and, and, but also all, the entire book is written out of the prism of 1940, or all the books. Right. You know, so to extract just one thing throws everything off. Oh, yeah, and I don't know. So I this isn't new. I want to be clear. Like, uh, it's not – this isn't a new phenomenon. This has happened for a long time. Um. 
for example, somebody I was reading on Twitter was bringing up that the Hardy Boys, which were a huge part of my life growing up, mm. were rewritten many times over the years. I probably read newer editions of most of them. Um, but the, there were, you know, a, a huge... They, they were, I mean, first of all, they were half ghost written anyway. They're like one of these huge, long series, and they're like sort of formulaic. They're a franchise. Of, right. Mm -hmm. So that like bothers me less, sort of. Um, it's still, it's still weird when you encounter it, when they, when people feel the need to rewrite stuff to meet like new sensibilities. Right. But, but yeah, like because that's more of a franchise, it like makes more sense to me that you would do that. Even right. though, even though it's annoying, it's like, it's like the Star Wars special editions. Like, yeah, yeah they refreshed it for the new audience maybe, but like. It's also kind of gross. Like a hot shot first. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. So, so you definitely like it, it's not new. It happens all the time, and people rework their own work too, right? Or like the example. I think I told you this before. When I was a kid, I was really into the Doctor Doolittle books. Yeah. Um, and the first Doctor Doolittle book, like the main one of the series. For, I grew up around all kinds of like weird old editions of books and stuff and like had all kinds of non PC books around my house yeah. that were like strange out of print things and textbooks from 1875 and stuff. Like, so I I originally read the original Dr. Doolittle book in some old edition that was around my house. And in it, a major plot point, like the climax plot point of the book is there in Africa and there's this African prince that wants to be white. So Dr. Doolittle has to like make him some formula that he can put on his face to like make his face white. Mm -hmm. And then like later I like took the book out of the normal library or whatever and read the book in a newer edition. And that part of the book was like completely gone. And I was so confused. I was like, where did the this whole part of the book go it didn't even occur to me to think that it might be offensive like at the time because it was just like part of the book you know and and it was like disconcerting that you would take something that was like a, and just like amputate weird parts of the story yes. and stuff like i almost respect more what they did with the dr seuss books where they just took the whole book out of print rather than like trying to erase stuff out of the book and put a different put a sticker on top of it of something else of the picture that they thought was offensive or something like right. just leave it alone make your own stupid book if you don't like that book you know oh, totally great like where, where are you on um on um Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer with uh, Jim's first moniker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I mean, Jim. No, I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it should be out there. Yeah. If you don't want to read it as it is, leave it alone. But, like, it was written that way. And, and you know, it, it put Mark Twain right in there as somebody who's, like, one of the good guys. Yeah. Right? And, and like, maybe, I also think that Mark Twain knew a little bit more than the academics these days who are judging his work. He saw a little bit more. He lived in a time where a little bit more was happening. Well, right. And I, I don't think you can reasonably cast Mark Twain as one of the bad guys of history or like not on the right side of history of slavery or the treatment of black people in America. Well, we're right. I mean, I don't think that that's a, a, a thing that you can do, given where he stood politically and the people that he popped up with in his as time. Fact, I don't know that I don't know for sure. But I bet you in some circles it was problematic that Tom Sawyer's best friend was that person. Yes. yes. That we're not allowed to say his name now. Right. Yeah. I mean, wasn't there a whole thing in um, Connecticut where a teacher got in trouble for reading the name of a James Baldwin book? Or yes. For saying the name of a James Baldwin <clears throat> book in, yes. in her classroom. Mm -hmm. I am not your not even really a bad word, but right. maybe sounds not good to our modern sensibilities yes you know i it's, people it's just a game this is a, these are everybody's on safari for racism now and looking for any oh is this my chance to get somebody i think i got somebody tony maz just said those guys look like the guys who sold your car i got him got him this is bagging big game hunting right yeah so it it just goes on and on and it shows itself in like more innocuous ways too. this like weird modernization of history right i i don't you know obviously there's this like pernicious like progressivization of trying to like make these older books okay 
to our modern standards um, because we're so out of touch with the past. We can't. And a lot of that, like I blame too for a lot of that, just the fact that a lot of people don't read enough old books, period, to start with. So mm-hmm. they don't have a sense of like what people talked to like or thought like or what the main issues were for that. You know, they, they have no idea. They have no idea. It would be hard for people to understand now, I think, now reading Mark Twain, how progressive Mark Twain is, because they don't like read or think a lot about 19th century literature. And and the past really is a different country. People did think very differently about and, and speak differently and mm-hmm. and and because people don't read nearly enough, <clears throat> don't shut it. I read fine. I read <laughs> um, too much, I feel. I think there's, I think there's um, a desire to take like the things that people feel people ought to be reading. Like, oh, World Doll's still good. But like, ooh, I don't know about this. Like, and then they clean it up a little bit, you know, instead of, instead of just ta- realizing that, 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 that people were different then and talk differently about things and all this well, stuff. Right, but I, was also so, about, I can't get over the fact that there's such an arrogance that that we are more enlightened now. That we right. know something now. Right. That you know the, the the challenges they had back then are something we cannot imagine now. Mm-hmm. Imagine. There was no penicillin for Mark Twain for Sam Clemens. Yeah. You know? Um yeah, John and Greenwood says got to get rid of Laura Ingalls Wilder corp punishment. Yeah. I mean that that's true. That's true. My buddy from high school Alyssa Rosenberg wants to uh it has to explain Laura Ingalls Wilder to her four-year-old to make sure she understands the context why of how they sh- talk why about Indians. Why did the show that we planned putting her on blast for that the never happened show, never we got happened. completely we got what completely thrown off by that we it's something else hijacked yeah. the show I forget what it was but yeah uh, but yeah it's it's total like lack of context on the way people were and I find it almost, in some ways, like worse when the ignorance is just on display on its own without, like, even being for some social justice reason, right? So there's this new movie out that I could already... It's being advertised to me relentlessly, um, but... I'm like upset by it and don't want to see it. And I could tell I was already going to be upset by it because, um, well, it's, it's called Emily and it's supposed to be about Emily Bronte, but it's like sort of a fictionalized version of Emily Bronte. Famously the sister of Charlotte Bronte. Mm -hmm. True. And, and Bronte. You're not shocked that I knew that. I'm I'm impressed that you knew even that, but yeah. Um, but it's like a love story with her. But I could already tell it was going to make me mad because she friggin' spends the entire trailer walking around with her hair down looking like a zillennial LARPing in a stupid 19th century dress. Oh, no. And oh, like... No. Who's, the, who's, the, who's the actress? Uh, you don't have to know. I won't Emma know her probably. Something or something. I didn't know her. M K. I I don't know. I, it, and it's, overall, the film has good reviews. And I take it it's not like meant to be historically accurate because yeah she doesn't you'll notice like in jane austen movies and stuff you know they never like just have their hair down like wandering around because that wasn't how women that would have right. been considered totally inappropriate to go around like that like so anyway Are you sick? i'm like my nose is itchy i almost feel like it's dusty I've or got something, something. In i've here. got something as of last night too i don't know that i'm sick i just or maybe pepper's right on me maybe she needs a tubby what? <laughs> she has dander. I don't know. He's a tubby. You calling yeah, beating the dog a tubby? <laughs> Jesus. I've been around little kids too long. Yeah. Um. So anyway, so then like I read more reviews of the movie and don't like say the dog needs a tubby again. <laughs> okay. Okay. I won't. I read more reviews of the movie and like the more I read, the more upset I, I got about it because it really is like just totally like modernized and apparently they gave short shift to charlotte bronte who wrote my preferred bronte novel which is jane Eyre, over wondering oh i thought those were all jane austen no jane Eyre is charlotte bronte oh emily bronte wrote wuthering heights oh wow they wrote a bunch of poetry they were these like 
sickly sisters who never like got out and did anything but lived an absolutely wild interior life with these like high gothic romantic novels that they wrote with all this were they english yeah and were they of uh women of means i mean enough means they weren't like but they working were, in the but they weren't live were uh living in um in what's that called? I don't believe they were ever like presented at court or anything like. Right, fancy. but they weren't they, living in a big manor like like Jane Austen movies. Yeah, kinda. They were okay. Yeah, but not uh, like. Um, can you not do that, please? Um. But yeah, and they also wrote a bunch of poetry and like other things, and and it, actually, like not that much is known about their lives because they weren't particularly like they didn't lead particularly eventful outside mm. lives so in in this movie to be fair to it um you know they might you know i th I think they're not intending to to like do a realistic depict i think it's like trying to be kind of cute and like modernized but it makes me so mad like just make your own dumb story then like why are you taking a real historical person and like making up this like invented zillennial person of them like let me i'm just gonna send you this like slate article i was reading about the movie this was i was just like reading this for my personal life and look at like the picture of her that's on there and tell me if that looks like a person from the 19th century or a person who has a TikTok channel. All right, I'm looking now. I'll fill those. Right? I mean, well, I don't know how to explain to you. But, you know, they they go through this whole thing, but you know, the whole the whole story that the movie's based on is apocryphal, but it's also like it's also like oh, meeting. Ha, 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 Does it look like <laughs> anything like a person from the 19th century should look? No, it looks no. like a chicken Fast and Furious 9. Right, but just in a dress. Right. On a moor. Right? Like yes. I, and th oh, that's, that's like that's why she's, I could already tell hot. from the trail that's why I could already tell from the trailer I was going to be upset. Um and <laughs> And I just, like, I don't understand why people feel the need to, like, cast themselves back into the past this way and pretend that things that happened in the past are, like, things that happen now when they're, like, not the same, you know? Yeah, no, this girl looks like a AOC. Yeah, and it, or, like, that's why even when, like, I didn't watch the new Lord of the Rings thing on Amazon or whatever, but and everybody was, like, talking about how conservatives were upset there was a black elf, which I didn't really see any conservatives being upset there was a black elf. Like, mostly I saw Who liberals Who has time claiming. to worry about the colors of elves <laughs> but, like, on Lord more, of the Rings? I was more upset that the black elf had, like, a buzz cut instead of having, like, long Legolas elf hair, right? Like, that bothered me more. It's, like, stuff like that that, like, takes me out of things mm -hmm. where like it just looks like random modern pe I don't think I would be able to stomach Bridgerton either to be honest. Which Bridgerton? That's that like period drama romantic thing but it's like all like multi-ethnic and modernized like anything Queen where the, Charlotte anything is black. Anything where like, the embedded like DEI consultant is making cast Well and, and I know a lot choices, of people who supposedly really <laughs> like Bridgerton. I'm sure we're gonna get emails on this where people are like no give it a chance you'd love it but I just like this weird like revisionist Thing. And like, I guess people just have fun with it. But I mean, I, I don't get why we need to play pretend that that the past is like we are now, you know, and, and, and that's like really the instinct that's at the heart of some of this Roald Dahl stuff. And some of this is, is just things feel foreign and weird to us. Well, yeah, but also it's that, oh, my goodness. We can't have this be seen by somebody because somebody somewhere will be hurt. Right. So do all the stuff, the painstakingly thing to do to, uh, you know, to clip off the rolled doll stuff because mm -hmm. somewhere somebody could be hurt. Right. It, you know, it, this idea that we're or, a better society case, where we make it so that nobody ever can be hurt by anything is freaking terrible, which is why, of course, the most important people left on the earth right now are the comedians because right. some of them at least aren't afraid to still hurt feelings. Mm -hmm. Right. Or even just, you know, it, even not be hurt. But like what's going on with this Emily thing is I don't think they cleaned her up so as not to be offensive, but just 
They feel a need to make the past more palatable by making it more like our lives now. There's a sense that like, oh, if we showed what Emily Bronte was really could have been like, people would find that boring. And that's true to an extent. I found Little Women to be an intolerably boring and, and dated book. And I think Louisa May Alcott's great and all that stuff. But I, I found the book to be boring because it was old and it was out of date and I didn't find it relatable. Mm. And and I think that that happens. And and to some extent, every like period movie is a little bit modernized. Like the hairstyles never really look like if you look at actual photos of like Civil War era hairstyles. They look weird, like especially like women's hairstyles were oh, weird. And also, and stuff. like at like, that time, there was also no makeup, right? Right, but and nobody's like, going to do that. Or like the weird beards Civil War generals have, or whatever. And like yeah. I look, well, I think of kind of, the, of in now, but I think of that era because that's like one of the earliest eras that we have like actual photographs of what people looked like. It looked like a bad time to be around. <laughs> it looked like there was no people humor are very in that. strange. And Lincoln looked well, terrible. You had to sit there still for a long time <laughs> for to the get picture. A picture? Really? Yeah, yeah, those like daguerreotype photos like have, isn't that what it's called Your that shot. you have of like lincoln and stuff part of the reason they're never smiling in them is because you it like took like i don't know how long like minutes and also like you nobody had to was, sit there yeah, but and, also nobody was told that it's a time to smile <laughs> be ha- fake that you're happy about this some like, cultures them happy? some cultures are still like that serbian people are like that when Serbian people used to see my lessons, I'd be like, why are you smiling for like a government ID photo? Like, But none of them are smiling in their photos. They're like, why would you smile for that? Why are you happy that the government's taking your picture? Like, I like your license pictures. Hmm. All right. Should we get to... All right. I just need your quick quick lightning round. Okay, Alice? Okay. Um, I just need your two cents because you're from the fashion industry. Pharrell? Mm-hmm. Pharrell? Pharrell? Pharrell, he yeah. is now um, running Ralph Lauren, or chief designer for Ralph Lauren. Thoughts on that? Cool. All I know is that he did Blurred Lines with Emily mm-hmm. Ratajkowski, who I did love. And the who, happy song. She now denounces she the She now Blurred denounces Lions it because she was waving her uh, Robin bosom Thicke. around. And Robin, uh, whatever. Okay, her too, I guess. Um, I want to go to the next thing I want to talk about, Alice, is something I actually own. <coughs> World Doll we did, sorry, is something I call the, do you air wrap how Dyson $600 air, ha- hair styler became a sensation? Do you have this? No, I don't so have this a, a $600 hair curler. Dollar hair curler. No, and they, it's the new thing they came out with after the success several years ago of their incredible hair dryer, which uh, started out being, I think, around the same, around $600. Now it's like 400 and something you can get it for, the hair dryer. But it's supposed to be amazing. Like, if I had money to burn, I would absolutely do it. I've always thought it was insane. Like, Dyson vacuums are like $700. Well, really? Yeah. Wow. So I don't, I've never, like, and people swear by them, but I'm just not in the $700 vacuum club. Yeah. People are like, it's like one of those things where people are like, oh my God, it's so worth it once you do it. And I'm like, I just, it's not, I I don't know, right? But so yeah, a few years ago, they said, you know, like we have all this engineering technology and stuff to blow wind at things like vacuums do, like we're going to invent a hair dryer. And they came out with this hair dryer that's supposedly amazing and dries your hair like so much faster and is like crazy good. And people, I mean, I assume people wouldn't spend four to six hundred dollars on a hair dryer unless it re- there really was some noticeable difference. Actually, one of your friends told me he got it for his daughter for Christmas. Really? Yeah. One of my friends? The hair dryer, yeah. The expensive daughter. Uh, yeah. Does his name begin with a K? Yes. Okay. We won't um, mention it. Um <coughs> and and we had this conversation about this device because wow. he was blown away that people spend this on this and we were talking about it but yeah like i had heard of it because it is a thing and yeah so now they have this styling thing too that's like for curling your hair and apparently it's also amazing and it's also six hundred dollars so you're if you want both you're in for more than a thousand bucks to style your hair but like yeah, would I? I mean, look at my scraggly hair. I don't know. I would do it <laughs> if beautiful. I had, if I like, you know, if it if it's that good and it works and it's amazing. Like I totally would. I, the most I've spent on a hair device is probably like three hundred bucks. Really? What is that? Um, 
I like a GHD straightener used to be about. What's a GHD straightener? It's a GHD is a brand of hair tools. They're like okay. they used to have really good straighteners. What's a strainer? Straightener. A straightener. Oh. Straightener with the two like I you probably oh. used it at your house when we were first dating where I right. go like this and like go yeah, down through my thing. hair. It looks yep. like a two cans. Mouth. Yeah, two like flat plates, yes. ceramic <laughs> plates, and you go like this and. But don't you have hair. straight hair? No, it's kind of like wavy or whatever, but that makes it all like smooth and like sleek and straight. Yeah, you know? but it's, Not it, like it, it burns scraggly. it, doesn't it? Well, you put product on it that's like protective to your hair. Really? But that's another reason why it might be worth it to have those like really expensive good ones because if the heat styling damages your hair, you're much better off if you have a dryer that can dry your hair in 10 minutes versus one where it takes 30 minutes, right? 30 minutes to dry your hair? Yeah, am I to blow dry it if it's long? Totally, it could. Yeah. Jesus, what a way to live. Just be a dude. <laughs> I'll think about it in my next fight. <laughs> what is the chat chat uh, called, Alice? It is the Chelsea Fire Wicked Hotline chat chat. Um, brought to you by Chelsea Fire Wicked Hot Sauce, which is an awesome hot sauce. Um, I hear they're coming out with new flavors too. You've did. To- email him and see if they have new talking points um because they're supposed to have new flavors which i'm super excited about and uh it's great uh super clean ingredients they use sea salt for reduced sodium you do not have to sacrifice heat for flavor with this hot sauce it has both and they also donate five percent of the proceeds to the fallen firefighters foundation so really just a win-win we should get him on john brown you can buy it at market basket and at big y and at chelseafirehotsauce.com so go for it hi Hey, Steve from Merrimack. Hey, Hi, Steve. Steve. Quick question. Was that Spencer Clavin or Cliff Clavin? Thank you. You don't get that, Alice. No, probably. I don't. No. no. You know what Cliff Clavin was on? No. Nothing? No. Nope. He was uh, on uh, Cheers. He was the mailman. Nice. Who I ran into a couple times. He used to stay at the Parker House when I used to stay there. And he was a fun guy, a nice guy, no airs about him. Would he occasionally go from establishment to establishment uh, around Boston? Probably in part because I'm sure he never had to buy a drink. I would say yes. Was he always in the best uh, disposition afterwards? Not necessarily. (laughs) But I enjoyed him. I liked him being around. You've had experience with that at our house, too. (laughs) What do you mean? Sometimes I'm not in a good disposition after I go out to bars either. That is true, Alice, but <laughs> rarely, rarely, my love. As long as I have my dearest love and my wonderful children around, I'm happy. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Steve from Hey, Steve. Two observations yes. from your discussion of bars and kids at bars. First of all, Tom's statement that he feels that the drinking is subsiding in society is a case of pure projection. He has been drinking less. And if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> he also goes to bars generally during the day. Right. Yeah. Right? On the weekends. Yes. And I, I raised that, too, in, in the show. And right. said, like, I wouldn't bring the kids to a bar, obviously, right. at 10 p.m. I can't imagine. Can you imagine, like, going out to a bar? I mean, we did, I guess, we did, I guess, a few years ago, like, six years ago. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine, like, going to a bar, like, going out, like, at 1130 at night? I, like, even if we had a babysitter <laughs> and, and all that stuff. The, the, the idea of it, it makes me nervous to think about it. Yeah, it's. I feel tired thinking about it, to be honest. Yeah. I try not to stay up that late. But yeah, I remember when I was young, I like couldn't believe like Boston's last call time is like so early compared to other places. Yeah. Like me and my friends always thought that was like so late. At 2 a.m., they stop yeah. serving drinks at 2 a.m. Who does that? Like my, night's but, just getting started. Now yeah. I think about that and I'm like exhausted just my, imagining My it. thought was when I was going out, like really going out in my early 20s, was that three hours was good enough. Two hours was okay of sleep. Two hours was okay. One hour is not good enough. And that was my mm-hmm. thing. But three hours of sleep. <laughs> directly from bars into the place. Holy God. And so there's not a ton of people. There are some, but there's not a ton of people getting bleep faced. Yeah. You know, <laughs> when the sun is out. But that's the problem. Second, you, that's where you're not seeing the drunk people. Right. They're I know. later than us. The, the drinking is subsiding. There's an intersection by where we both live in the Merrimack Valley. It's yeah. in Amesbury, Mass. Route 110 and the Stop and Shop, 
Yep. They yeah. must nail 15 drunk drivers a week in there. <laughs> uh, buddy, I know, got whacked coming from a Patriots game a few years ago, and he's in a class with like 25 other people, and like <laughs> 10 or 12 of them were from Amesbury that yeah. past weekend. Uh, yeah. That makes sense. As a matter of fact, we used to talk to somebody who said in, in, in North Reading, Kitties is where like uh, three fourths of the drunk driving arrests come from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, <clears throat> I like there's a good packy there at that uh, at that stop and shop. We also like that Mexican restaurant there. The We've Grande been several Mexico. times. Alice had a wonderful evening there recently, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, and I do like that stop and shop. I'm a stop and shop guy. I always have been. Always have been. But uh, yeah, that whole area that is that is between us. And we thought of you, Steve, this weekend. As a matter of fact, because we were going to go. When were we going to? You wanted to go to the New Old Oak. New Old Oak, right? And that was was that that was just you and I, right? We had the uh, sitter here, right? Yeah, we talked was that, about was it. Was that but we yesterday didn't go or that Saturday? Way. That was yesterday, right? I think so. So we ended up not going. We just went to the gym to check it out, and then we got out of there. Mm-hmm. But we were going to go to that bar, pl- bar you told us to go to. Uh, the Steve. other one. Yeah, the other one. <laughs> Uh, an extreme example of kids in a bar. When I was uh, working in a bar in Ithaca, New York, in the mid 1980s, mm-hmm. uh, a uh, we had hippie nights. We had Grateful Dead cover bands that would come in sometimes, and a uh, young hippie couple with a what looked like a newborn in in a carrier uh, tried to check their baby in coat check. That's fantastic. This would be the extreme <laughs> example of babies in bars. Thank you, Alice. You think I have a problem with that? No. I have no problem with it. I have no problem with it. My my mother in law used to tell me the story about her friend who used to tie her kids to a tree with a rope, and not hanging, but you know, <laughs> so that they wouldn't escape. And I also have no problem with that. I have no problem with that. Steve from Merrimack. Uh, Steve from Merrimack may actually run the table tonight because these are all say anonymous. Steve has been going in anonymous. Uh, <laughs> one last message regarding Spencer Clavin. Yes, yeah. mm-hmm. I bailed on that thing. Like eight minutes into it, I'm sorry. Eight I didn't even fast forward to the chat chat. I what? Uh, I've been studying Spanish and regarding the Spencer Clavin uh, <laughs> interview. No mas, okay? <laughs> Por favor, no mas. Thank you. That's a uh, famously a uh, famous boxing fight where the boxer was saying no mas, no mas. I've had enough. <clears throat> it wasn't for everybody, Spencer. Clavin. I can see that from the listen. I can tell you this that um, that I thought Alice was just. Awesome on it. I was I was in awe at how. Well, I had a great time. So right. the rest of you can. Sorry, yes, yeah, that's know. right. And <laughs> you, and Alice is going to announce he's going to be a permanent part of the show very soon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can just hear the pure joy in Tom's voice when. Hi, Tim. There was all those voicemails that we left about us not liking the guest that uh, basically Alice had on the show. Hey, some a hit, <laughs> some a miss. No big deal if we left it all up to Tom. Uh, by the way, the person who calls electronic equipment the thing, um, the Apple bigot, you know, would, would be hearing interviews with someone who knows how to swing a hammer and the science behind that. So just take solace in that, Alice. Um, I'm still Team Alice. And last thing, Tom, I used to work at a corner store for years, and yeah. there were people who would come in, and there was this one old timer. He would come in, and he'd steal a candy bar every day, and my boss would just say, just let him have it. He's special. So, <laughs> well, you think you might have been stealing something? They probably saw you take it and just thought, that guy's special. <laughs> He's just special. God bless you. Thank you. It's yeah, probable. makes him makes him happy. You care to tell the people what I was stole? No. Okay. <laughs> I feel cute about. No, Why do you feel cute I about it? I don't feel cute. That said, Tim and Ken called today in KMS, which you need to listen to. Later. Okay. Called KMS asking Kirk. I- that telling Kirk that he was trying to get Peter French's number and wasn't getting called back. <laughs> and, of course, it, Peter French died, unfortunately, very young, not even 30 Ugh. years old, in 2002. So it was a very vicious Tim call. But um, but, um, but I just thought it was, I just thought it was uh, funny. It was, it was notable. Peter French, once again, Peter French and Vandy French and Mr. French, the Frenches, mm-hmm. attended what church with what? The first Congo with the Shattuck family. Exactly before there was uh, before there was a rainbow. I've heard fish. a rumor, by the way, because I had to look this up mm-hmm. for our nuptials. Mm-hmm. Um, that you actually didn't start out at the first Congo. Well, that you started out and were initially baptized at the second Congo. 
so I, I I'm I recognize that, but I was oh, that was before I was a biped. I think I, I was <laughs> I went to the for, first Congo for this. Yeah, because I had to go find your baptismal certificate, and uh, it was not at the first Congo. They said we, uh, I forgot what you call it, confirmed. We call I was it, confirmed. We call it chrismation. Congo. So I don't right. know what you call it. I called it getting Nintendo. <laughs> yes. Confirmation was with us. But he was baptized at the second Congo, so we don't have his baptismal certificate. I was not baptized at the second Congo. I've never, I have no relax memory yes, of being were. in there. The second Congregational Church of Winchester, you were That's, baptized there. You oh, started well, oh, off I was. going there. Okay, it's probably yeah. And then I contacted yeah. them. They also okay. did not have I you your confirmed. record. Yeah. Well, the, the, it's it's there. I'm I'm in good standing with the church, the first Congregational Church in Winchester, Massachusetts. It's the nicest church. Uh, that me and the Frenches. Carter Both Dom, the first Congo. Carter Dom, Catherine Ford, Christy Van Aken, all the good families. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the M. Murphys and the M. Minahans went to the Catholic Church. Any Orthodox churches in Winchester? No, but they went to St. E. St. Eulalia's, which is a Catholic church. Wonderful. And St. Mary's. Shockingly, there's a St. Mary's in that town as well. But hmm. There you go, well, Alice. Go ahead. Um... I was just going to say that um, both the churches, the first Congo and the second Congo, had woman pastors when I had to try and get your paperwork. Impossible. Impossible. Mm. No way they'd do that. No way they'd do it. And so I assume the rainbow flags are flying high now. So. Alice! Thank you so much for listening, uh, as usual. I'm not sorry about the Spencer Clavin episode, guys. I'm not, I'm not sorry about it. I don't take it back. Good. Um, and uh, if you, More like that coming. If you want to join us live for Patreon stuff or extra content, you can do that at patreon.com slash burn barrel. Of course, you can always find the show for free at burnbarrelpodcast.com. That's also where you can leave chat chat messages. Email us burnbarrelpodcast at gmail.com.